Hello, everybody. Tony here with the Patio Slave Podcast, which I think you probably knew since you clicked on us uh, with Anthony and Nate. As always, how you boys doing? Doing fantastic. Ready to uh, do the thing this week, like always. Yeah, thanks for asking, man. I didn't even ask last time, so I appreciate you and your concern. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. No, I mean that, that's that's why we're all here. We're here to to check and balance each other. Uh, episode forty seven. <laughs> is that right, gentlemen? Forty seven. Wow. Yeah. Whew. We're coming up on a year, which is wild. If you think about that for a second. I think we're what six weeks away from a year, which is uh, pretty pretty nuts. So first off, hit the socials uh, at Patio Slave on Twitter, or Instagram. Email us Patio Slave Podcast at gmail dot com. Uh, we did hear from some people this week who checked out some of the episodes, back catalog, stuff like that. Much appreciated. We, we really love hearing from you guys. And uh, our winner, we hear from our winner for the contest, Win Nate's Nerdery. He got his hat, his stickers, and his uh, his posters. So he was pretty excited. So, yeah, shouts to you guys for, for keeping it real and talking to us and, you know, just engaging. It's fun. We love this shit. Yeah, man. And uh, so last week we did the uh, Long Island Deep Dive so, Brendan, if you're listening, if you are, thank you so much for listening, but also thank you for your time last week. We had uh, we had such a good time last week, and the response to the episode has been fantastic. Uh, I think a lot of people resonate with that scene, whether you lived there in that scene. We've had some people that actually grew up there that uh, liked the episode, but just if you like the music. I mean, there's such a broad range uh, of, of bands to come out of it that it's really resonated with people, and kind of the perfect region for us as a podcast because there's stuff that you know maybe you don't like nate that i do and vice versa and but it just works because we have crossover between us the bands and crossover you know with them and different sounds and it uh it really worked so i think that uh we'll look to do another regional deep dive again so thank you for everyone that's checked us out and thank you brendan yeah brendan was super cool to come on i feel like we always talk about it on here it humanizes the uh the music and the the background of the the vocals and the story of the you know the music so really cool for him to come on can't wait to do something like that again and uh get nerdy with uh whoever whoever's next yeah and to hear new incendiary which it sounds like they're in the lab as he said so yeah that's exciting stuff maybe they'll they'll save our 2021 down the line this year and maybe we'll get to see him see him live too which would be fucking phenomenal i'd love to like next november like incendiaries in the cave. Port City Music Hall, if that reopens. Ooh, if they're back, yeah, yeah, that would be perfect. That would be pretty, pretty damn dope. I'd hang up on the side there and just watch it all go down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Exciting stuff. So thanks everybody for checking us out last week. And if you've stayed, awesome. We appreciate it. We got a fun one for you tonight. Nate, you want to lay out what the segment is, and then we'll we'll do our set list stuff. Totally. Yeah. The, so the segment, uh, another one of those things where we don't, really don't have a name for it. We were trying to hash it out. We couldn't quite come in to a name for the segment but it's basically uh commercial flops i guess albums that kind of got passed over by some pretty heavy hitter um, artists and uh, we revisited three different albums uh, basically from three different genres and did a deep dive independently to give our personal take on the on these three albums and we like them do we hate them do we agree that they should be a commercial flop because the commercial flop thing is a very mainstream consensus on this album isn't good that doesn't necessarily mean on a fan standpoint that it's not good and uh, we'll kind of go into you know the the weeds on that so should be pretty fun i think uh we're gonna have some hot takes today i'm excited definitely be hot takes yeah three good albums we won't tease them now but three good albums to do this with so yeah the uh the first the 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 set list is is short tonight it consists of an article sent to us from a listener in texas he uh he shot at this maybe a week plus ago but couldn't get to it last week because we had the the long island deep dive uh live nation their stock which stocks are obviously a hot hot topic the last couple of days anyway but the live nation stock just kind of killing it right now even though they don't have open venues and don't have people in them with live music how's that how's that work Uh, yeah i mean i think this headline is a head scratcher but it's par for the course for what's going on now where there's crazy insane valuations i don't think this is a scenario where it's being propped up like a pump and dump i don't think it's to that extent but i think you know people price stocks at what they perceive really the future value is right you know where they place it and obviously they, th- if you're pricing this stock at an all-time high, so that means the public perception is better now than it was pre-COVID. I don't fall for that. I don't get that. 
but yeah, I mean, the gist, so the article was, yeah, you know, Yahoo Finance, Live Nation shares hit record highs this week. So what they're doing is they've shifted from the live concerts to offer like drive-in shows, live streams, and new content through their live from home virtual music hub. So like that's their revenue intake. Like that ain't going to cut it for me. I don't get it. I, I don't get it. I wouldn't touch this. I'd short the hell out of this thing. <laughs> well, there's a few things at stake, right? So they acquired a company called Veeps, um, which is a live streaming service actually put on by the Madden brothers of good Charlotte fame. So, and they sold it to um, Ticketmaster uh, slash Live Nation. So the stock price jump was in part to that. Um, I think there's some speculation that when concerts do come back, anytime there's a press release from, you know, the CDC, like we talked about a few episodes ago, that maybe live events will be coming back, you know, Q Q3 of this year even. So all that pent up, you know, energy and fandom that's kind of waiting could allude to just some, you know, sold out concerts, like residencies, just pre-sold kind of thing. So there could be, you know, some rhyme or reason to it, but I'm, I'm with you, uh, Tuan, that it's, it's a little exaggerated. I don't know if it's really going to play out the way that they're, they're pumping it to be. And obviously <laughs> we've had our, uh, our say on Live Nation and Ticketmaster on here before. So there's always that. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good point. I I am a little leery of it too. Just it doesn't make a ton of sense that these massive venues are empty. There aren't people in them and they're valuated where they were pre-pandemic. Even with the Live at Home and the acquisition of Veeps, which is cool. Veeps, the idea of Veeps was cool before it it sold out. Now I'm not so sure it's as cool because some of the words that were said by the Madden brothers about what Veeps was supposed to be now don't feel as true they feel kind of hollow because they've been sold to big business so i don't know it's it's an interesting it's an interesting spot for that company to be where they are now they're going to be the only game in town as far as big venues go when we do get back to that stuff so they they will make their money you know it'll get big again and it'll be people will be itching to go to concerts and bands are going to be itching to put music out so they can go play on those those albums and those concerts for people. So uh, I just don't, I don't understand how it's like that today, but stock market's been fooling people, you know, the last nine months for all kinds of different reasons Uh, with the way the economy really is and the amount of money that's been pumped into the stock market. It just doesn't make a ton of sense. So Nate, I'm going to disagree with you on the, anyone who bought live nation stock or it, you know, it increased as a result of the veeps acquisition. It makes no sense. Because that's cash out the door. The one thing of Veeps, Veeps was a traded company, you know, and their their shareholders got a bump, but because they got bought out, this doesn't make any sense. Because that that would prop the price. Because if you the article mentioned that last year Veeps made over ten million dollars for themselves, the artists that played the Veep shows made only ten million dollars. That means the Veeps platform took a cut of that. So, you know say best case scenario they made 10 million dollars that's nothing to nothing to sneeze about really for for a company like live nation i'd love to see the right. revenue numbers but i don't know if people price that in jokes on them they'll they will lose money yeah there's a few variables to it i mean the ceo of live nation mentioned that it's it would complement their core business right so it's additional revenue let's say on a sold out concert i think he's quoted as saying you know if you didn't get into a show or there's a show across the world that you can't see now you can stream it through Veeps. So now you're looking at a capacity venue sold out, and then you're you know seven xing that venue capacity based on the Veeps live stream, and that's additional tickets sold. But at you know to your point too, like it's not much, but it's still more. It's still overselling the. Uh, it's like overselling a, an airplane, right? They always have expect people not to show up, so they're making as much money on a capacity on a flight that's oversold, hoping that people like you know, can't make the flight and then they can pass out the vouchers after kind but, of thing. But did they need to buy Veeps to do that? They could have done that on their own. They got the money they probably the could capital, have. right? You know, like I'm I'm a little Yeah. I'm I'm wondering why they even bought it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I guess maybe for the infrastructure, for the website, for the name. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh independent in quotation marks goes. So it looks and sounds more indie than hey, here's a live nation platform. No, here's Veeps. It was started by artists, for artists. And it just sounds good, even though they own it. So that that's my thing. Just trying to dupe some people with that is my guess. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think that's that's part of it. Yeah, I mean, 
it, it it's not uncommon for them to acquire something. I mean, they probably again they're acquiring them for, for their in infrastructure and what they their footprint right now. But Nate, you made a good point in that. I'm more thinking of it through the lens of during COVID. But you're right. Post COVID, this does allow you to oversell. Yeah. It does allow you to oversell a venue. I mean, and there are people that will do it. I don't know. I mean, it'll no. be unlimited. However many people can get to a computer or a uh, Apple TV or Fire Stick or whatever to watch a um, concert through an internet connection can pay to do so. So that makes sense to yeah. for, for me. But I just don't know, understand why they needed to buy Veeps for it, other than maybe optics. Yeah, mm, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, that. But also, it's one and and tone like it's probably just another one of their plays as well. We don't want to compete with them, so we'll just buy it. You know. You know, we don't want to have someone outside of us yeah. that has any control whatsoever. And because it's a, you know, you know, what do they, what do they say? It's for the artist, from the artist kind of thing. They're like, yeah. shit, we don't want that control to go to the artist. So we'll just buy this and make sure that it's still in-house for us. But yeah, any like Live Nation, like amphitheater show, like they squeeze so many people on the lawn. And you think like those lawn seats are always, you're watching the show on a Megatron. So those, those shows are already being recorded. So now they're just streaming it out to the world, you know? So they're just seeing, they're seeing this as a, a way to make, a ton of money, basically. That's a great. I see what you're saying, Tone. Like, what did they actually buy? Because to your point, Nate, they're already doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, it, yeah. It's the only difference now is they could, they would broadcast it out. Well, they they could do that through some. They could do that before. Yeah, they didn't I think need it's beeps. I think it's brand name. It's opti. It's it's. You're right. It's positioning as if they're one of us. Live Nation That's exactly is exactly what it is. Yeah, I don't know what they are because, but they just have a lot more money and. <laughs> They're the only game in town. But, I mean, I, I've toyed with – we've talked about watching live streams at home. I'm thinking about buying the Jimmy Eat World future. Uh, yeah, it's Futures Friday night. I'm, yep. I'm definitely thinking about doing that. Um, and I, I, I like I do like it. It's a way to watch music. But my, my thought here is they don't – they didn't need to buy this company for that. I wonder if they had a relationship with Good Charlotte before. Who knows, man? Like, I'd love to know how that came about. I, I see it. I'm visualizing like literally like a silent auction or not a silent auction, an actual auction where people are raising their hand with their number and like it's the room with Amazon and Apple and Live Nation's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Live Nation's like, fuck that. We own this. We're not going to let someone. Right. You know, but cut I, into I, I, I agree with you, Nate, but they could do it on their own with their own capital. They have the money to do it. They don't need good Charlotte. They don't yeah, need no, no, beeps. totally, totally. That's that's yeah. my other than for the hey, this is for artists by artists bullshit, which is now no longer the case. Right? Yeah, yeah. For Live Nation, say, by Live Nation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for Live Nation, f for us, by us. Are we foo booing? Is that what's happening here? <laughs> so I got a, I got a question. Like, th and this is actually this isn't a segue because this was the only kind of set list item, but it's tied to the Jimmy Eat World thing. Mm. I think for that to like have legs, there must be like an app involved because take that Jimmy Eat World thing on Friday. If there was a way to watch that on my Apple my Apple TV, then I'd be more inclined to watch it. But if I'm limited to just my phone or my laptop, I don't know. It's kind of like just watching a YouTube video. But if I could have it on my, you know, big TV, you know, with the speakers and everything. Airplay, bro. S stream it right to the mirror, right to the TV. See, I, That's uh, what I'm doing. I, I need, I apparently need some help with that. I can come over. Well, I'm at an some Apple point idiot down the road. Still. Yeah. A decade or whatever. I'll FaceTime you <laughs> on one of our many Apple products or Zoom like we're doing right now, and uh, I can walk you through the process. That's how I watched. Uh, that's how I watched Maddie's Christmas thing it was on the TV oh, through nice. my laptop. Yeah, oh, and then, I mean, it's connected to my television, which is connected to my soundbar, so it sounds pretty good. So I would imagine that's a live stream in the living room. I would imagine the Jimmy World one's going to sound phenomenal comparatively. Not to knock the, the live stream in the living room. That that shit's awesome too. But right, uh, they're going to have bells and whistles on purpose because you're paying for it yeah maybe i'll how much is it do you know 15 14 something yeah like that. hey why not i fucking love that album that's why i mean if it's an, yeah. another album i may not i almost did it for surviving which they did a couple weeks ago uh, and i love that album too but I, i've spent more time with future so i'm like ah, i kind of want to do it you know I, I may do it that may be my friday night Twan, it's the perfect uh segue because i missed the future's anniversary tour so this is like my chance to like see it kind of like this live nation thing like hey you missed it we're gonna stream it you know so i get to catch the futures front to back now because i didn't get to see the tour that was i think it rolled through la and not san diego but at the same time i'm like well shit that's part of the you know the special part of going to shows you either you see it or you don't if you don't you know too bad but that's the that, that's what makes it special so mm -hmm. this kind of takes away from it to be honest 
Like, ah, oh, now you can get every show on demand. Hmm. Right. Is that good well, or bad? I don't know. And and we're talking about this like it, it <laughs> this is gonna drop Monday. So this already ha- futures already happened. I've already watched it. With your listening right. right now. So yeah. to, to talk about futures, like <laughs> we're giving it to you. We're talking about stocks. We're talking about Jimmy Oro. We're talking about futures everywhere right now. Uh, pun heavy today. Uh, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> pun heavy, like Jordan Pun Dick. Speaking of which. Oh, man. Is that- <laughs> so that was your segue. My segue was going to be, um, so we're talking about albums that you'd pay to see live. Would you pay f- to see any of these live? But uh, ooh, yours is better. Ooh, well, oh, like like no, that. yours is better. No, nah, you, no. you, you, you busted out a uh, the new, the lead singer of New Found Glory's name. Oh, it's perfect, Nate. I like it. Let's go with yours. So to to recap, as Nate said a little earlier in uh in the the pre uh the segment tonight, we're gonna kind of go through three albums. Um, the first one being a New Found Glory album that maybe didn't hit in the moment commercially the way that they should have, or even with fans the way that they should have. So, yeah, we're going to start with Newfound Glory. What album, Nate? Uh, the album is called Coming Home, which dropped in September of 2006, which seems, literally seems like forever ago. That is a long time. It was 15, almost 15 years ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it seems, like, it seems like 50 years ago, the way time is these days. It's just like, what? It's a different person. It's a different human being. You want to lead off with your thoughts? Sure, yeah, yeah. So... This album, I guess, like we were saying, like it's not, these aren't necessarily commercial success albums. So this one may or may not have been overlooked by certain fans and at least by the, the general consensus from the media. And we got to take that with a grain of salt, I guess, um, because I personally love this friggin' album. And I always liked Newfound Glory, but this album, like, really was the first one where I would like listen to it nonstop all the time. I'm not really sure why. Um, I had the physical copy. So I think I had it in my car, and it's one of those, like, I can toss it on because it's within arm's reach kind of thing. But lots of uh, cool connotation to the album because I was packing up to move to New York City. This is 06, and I landed in New York City, I mean, from Maine, so, you know, just drove down or whatever, in 07. But I was still spinning this record all the time, and it just reminded me of, like, all the lyrical content in this album. It was, like, literally, like, me going back to Maine to, like, my own home, like, old home, seeing you guys and friends and family and just all the words resonating with, you know, certain love, th- like things associated with love and friends and family and being gone all the time. I felt like I was always gone, you know, and this was like the start of my journey of moving to different states throughout the country. So, yeah, I, I personally really like this album. So even if it was a flop, it wasn't a flop for me. I like every song on the album. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. It's interesting. This is kind of one of those like albums that, like you said, when it came out, critical reception was not very good. The fan reception was not very good. But now, I think now, because again, context is key. If you came up with Newfound Glory, you're like our age now, right? You're mid-30s, like if you came up with them. But think about when this album came out. You were 20, 21, and you're maturing. The band's maturing, so you're still trying to figure it out. This is an album that if you kind of read the narrative online, people love this album. And I think... In the moment, this was the last, a few things you had going on. It was the last record with Geffen on the, whatever contract with was MCA, then Geffen, I think. Mm-hmm. So you had that going on. You know, the age thing. They're what, mid-20s, I think at the time. So you have like the mature lyrical content that probably took people off guard, right? That caught them off guard. Yep. And just kind of, you know, this is known as like the departure album. It was, they were strings. I think there was some synth in it. Like at the time. Piano. James Dewey, James Dewey's of Reggie and the Full Effect, and I think Get Up Kids, he toured with them, uh, touring off this record on the keyboard. Wow! So like they toyed around with some new sounds. I don't think people were were ready for it. And I love this album. It's a front to back, and I still listen to it. I don't know monthly. It's one of those records for yeah. me. Wow! I full disclosure had never listened to this record until today. Whoa! Wow. So, and you guys had told me to, and it was definitely on my list of things like I need to get to. Being a fan of the band, growing up with them like we all did, but yeah, it was uh, it was a fun listen, especially through you know my mid thirties lens. I was like, yep, this this is this hits the the spot for me. This is a, a an album I would want to hear from this band as they get a little older and a little more mature. And then I thought back to myself at twenty two when this came out and thought. Nah, man, I, I probably would have wanted, you know, My Friends Over You or, you know, something along the lines of uh, yeah. Sticks and Stones Catalyst type 
Newfound Glory. So I maybe wasn't ready for it then, and that's why I didn't listen to it then. But it is really good. It was a first listen for me, which, you know, that's always a, a fun thing when you find go back and find an album from a band that you already liked and you have a first listen, you can slot it right in with the other ones and come back to it, and I'm sure I will with this. Uh, like you said, uh, they, they toured with a keyboardist. you know who played keyboards on the uh, on the album? Some of the keyboard stuff, some of the piano stuff? No. I found no. this in my in my uh, travels today, Ben Montench of the, uh, the heartbreakers, Tom Petty's band. Whoa. Oh, really? Is, yeah. Which, and I mean, they did the recording at Jackson Brown's studio. So it had that classic rock is it morning view. That one. Yeah. It had that. Well, that's the house they lived in, but they, oh, that's the house. Okay. Yeah. Then they, they record, they, they lived in the house to write it and come up with stuff, but they recorded it in Jackson Brown's studio and they had a different producer. Um, they, they, not parted ways with Avron, but they were like, it's time for something different. And they, yeah. you could tell, like, there's just, it's a different sounding record than what they had been doing to that point. So it's, it's great. Yeah. Like, I'm, I will come back to this numerous times now that I finally listened to it and prepped for this. And some of the tidbits that I found were cool. Like, that, that, that Heartbreakers thing was cool. I thought that was an interesting thing. Yeah. That is interesting. Kind of elevates them a little bit. This is the first album that I can honestly say I can sing every song almost. I, I know that I can, cause today I listened to it for this and I could sing every song, every lyric, which is, this is like one of few, I don't know many songs and albums by heart in full. So this is like one of maybe 10 or something, but uh, yeah, man, such an, such a great album. And the drum work, I guess, I guess I never really paid attention. Like today I really paid attention to like individual artists. I do this sometimes when we do like these deep dives and uh, what's his name? The drummer, the drummer Cyrus. for the band. Cyrus, Cyrus Baluki. his drum work on this album is fantastic. It's very clear. So the production on this album is really, really crystal clear because you can hear everything. Yeah. So I was blasting it today and kind of geeking out. You notice, I think this is the best Jordan's ever sounded. Yeah, it really is. I, it's so funny you say that. I listened to this tonight while walking my dog and I was like, Jordan is, he's in his bag in this album because he's, he can actually, like he, we know he can sing, but he's actually singing. You know, it's not yeah. like, um, you know, the typical pop punk stuff and the song, like these are actual songs. Like there's the song structure is the best. Yeah. That the, out of any album, the song writing, the lyrics, the lyrics, I think actually Chad writes the lyrics. And I want to say there's a lot of relationship stuff. Like you say on this, Steve, on this Steve album. did too a lot back then before, before his oh, exit with what was going on. Different story for a different day. We're not going to get too deep into that, but yeah, yeah. Steve did some too. But if you you know we you think about what came before this was Catalyst you know that was you know major label but it had a little edge to it you know what I mean it was heavier than Sticks and Stones yeah for the most part then they come to this it's lighter and um, the album after this Not Without a Fight w- they even doubled down on that heavier sound that's a pretty heavy album I think that's on Epitaph maybe yep I can't remember but that's heavy like they lean into some of the real punk and hardcore roots and. Um, I almost think I almost get the vibe that they were like disappointed with the reception of coming home. Yep. Like they, mm-hmm. I think it might be known as their, one of their favorites. Actually. I think I remember reading that. You think they thought like maybe they, the fan reception is they sold out because this album is so not poppy, but it's very, like you said, the songs are all perfectly structured. I think they, if people thought that they would have thought that after nothing gold can stay with the self titled yep. Cause they, I mean, they were like a punk boy band. I mean, in yeah. a way, you know, at that point. Well, and I mean, with that and then Sticks and Stones and then Catalyst, like those were all commercially successful. So for them to change their sound, that's a departure. Obviously, the departure album, as you said, Tuan, it's not. It's hard to sell out when you've been selling out the other way, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny you brought up, we were bringing up uh, Jimmy Eat World earlier with Futures, because I feel like this is Newfound Glory's Futures. You know, it's front mm-hmm. to back. It's a story Yeah. that kind of, there's a storyline that goes throughout the whole album right into the last song and the last verse. So I always like that stuff. It's not necessarily a concept, but you can clear, clearly see that like the writing was all done at the same time. They're not like random songs that might've been like on a few album cycles before or something that got dropped in or something like that. So mm. yeah, man, huge fan huge fan of this album you know what i love and and we've we've talked about this off and on throughout the life of the pod over the last year when a pop punk band matures it goes one of two ways it goes horribly wrong or it it goes really really well and it's really hard to do i think 
Blink self-titled. Yeah, Blink self-titled. Yeah, yeah. I think the Menzingers do it really well with the, their stuff, their newer stuff now. It's a hard thing to do, though. Like, it's it's not right. an, a genre of music that lends itself to growing up. But yeah, right. if you can pull it off, and I think they really, Newfound Glory really does here, and other, a couple other bands have done that in the past, it's fucking awesome. And, you know, 36-year-old me is like, I love this music anyway. So the fact that they're able to kind of pull it off, and it's still Newfound Glory, but it's got a little bit more of a you know, structure to it and a little bit more soul maybe. Yeah. I love it. I want that. I want all of that at my age now. Yeah. Actually that that's a great point. Cause like you would almost think in the trajectory of their career, this would have come out later mm. in the later half, any earlier for this album to come out, it would have really been kind of weird. Like imagine uh, nothing gold can stay into self-titled then into this, like that would have been a w- wild, yeah. weird departure. Yeah. Wouldn't have made sense with all the, f- the, the hype they had around. Right. Yeah, it wouldn't have made yeah. sense. I'm, I'm down for Coming Home Part 2. I mean, after that last yeah. record, which kind of, doub- again, doubled down on the roots, Coming Home Part 2. Let's do it. Marshall Mathers Part 2. I mean, there's other been artists that have done that. Yeah, they have. <laughs> Any uh, key tracks that pop out for you guys? Like maybe Top 2? Boulders is great. Mm-hmm. Love and Pain. Connected. There's not a dud. I mean, yeah, On My Mind with the guitar intro. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, taken back by you. Did you say familiar landscapes? I didn't, but I would agree if you think that. Yeah, well, I wrote down that. Too good to be and hold my hand are like my top three. I think on this album. I was gonna say oxygen, hold my hand. The the start of the album is awesome to me. Yeah, I remember again earlier today throwing it on and getting halfway through that through that first song and thinking, "You got me, guys. I'm gonna listen to the rest of this. This is exciting." Instead of I gotta, you know, skim through it and hope that I can fake it till I make it tonight. No, no, this is really good. <laughs> One, uh, full disclosure, I say it's a front to back, yet I do skip It's Not Your Fault. That was the first single, and it's the slow one, and it's got the yeah. piano, got the keys in there. I like that song. It's a good song, but I, I heard it too much, I yeah, think. Yeah, fair enough. That was the it was the single, the first single, right? Yeah. Which came the out in the summer, summer of 06, I believe, on my birthday, which is interesting. July 25th? Thanks for telling everyone, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, they could... They could look it up. <laughs> I know. I wanted to make them go. I wanted to make Chip or Mike or any of those guys go and do it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the only one, actually, I think that's, you know, it's funny. I think now all three of us have given our birthdays on the podcast. Not the year, but yeah, you can figure it out at this point. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. We good. Uh, I think we're good with NFG. I think the consensus for us is, uh, for me, I guess I can, I can understand why it got the reaction it did, but I didn't have that same reaction. I think I did have that reaction because I didn't listen to it in the moment. There you go. In the moment. Yep. So, But like coming back to it now, it hits for me very well today. So I'm not sure if it would have if I had listened to it then and then listened to it today. Yeah, for me, like I was a fan and this made me more of a fan. Like almost like I like this more than, it's my, like I said it before, it's my favorite album by them. So it's like uh, re-invigorated on the band. I was like, ah, oh, nice. This is the way you should go. You should go in this direction. I like it. All right, who Tone, you're picking the next one. All right, let's go. Let's save the let's save the the one that I think we're going to differ on for last. Uh we'll go Kingdom Come by the one and only Jay-Z, Sean Carter. I want to start there. Well, and we'll, the third one I think we're going to have a little more of a uh a differing opinion, so we'll get to that one later, but yeah, Kingdom Come. Uh Jay-Z's album from 2006 as well, I believe, right? Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah, this was his uh, his first album after his retirement. I say that in air quotes as well. After the Black album, which was, you know, obviously epic and just front to back Jay Z album, uh, him at the peak of his powers, with Kanye producing stuff and with you know just just a great record. Um, to jump back in with this, what he wanted to do was release this as Sean Carter and not Jay Z. Like Jay Z would have been retired with uh with the black album and then he would release this as sean carter but he ended up releasing it as jay-z because he's jay-z like you can whatever dude we all know you're sean carter as well but you're jay-z like drop your out your album as jay-z we don't need different names and diddy p diddy puff daddy any of that crap let's we're good <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're jay-z and you're an epic prolific amazing lyricist like drop your album as jay-z makes sense the thing that struck me in looking back on this is how many people were involved in making this record. Yeah. I mean, just production alone, I think you had Dr. Dre, Kanye, Pharrell, Neo, 
DJ Khalil, some guy named Science who I'd never heard of. Like, there's just so many people that were helping with um, producing the track. So for me, the albums, the songs that on the album that I really like are the ones produced by Dre and or Kanye. And that's about it. Like, I think the the other ones I'm not as into. There are a couple of really good tracks for me, but we can save that for when we talk about tracks at the end. But yeah, it's it's a mess as far as a Jay-Z album goes. Uh, and it's right in between two albums I really like. I really like, I mean, I love the Black album. Who doesn't? This album's got a couple spots on it that are good. And then I think the American Gangster album is underrated in his his uh, his canon, his his discography. A lot of people don't love that one, but I think it's really good compared to this especially. So what do you guys think? Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. Um, and kind of earlier, like to the New Found Glory thing, I was moving to New York City. So this album dropped in... November, I think, right? Of 2006. Yeah, November 21st. So I was like fresh in New York City. There's this album is on every billboard, Times Square, like in your face, you know? And I was like, shit, with that kind of promotion, this album better better be good. And I remember checking it out one time. I listened to it one time. I'm like, damn, man. Like after the Black album, it's it's hard to to come back and, you know, be at the same level because it's just not even, it's not even close. And I think because it was such a big production and big send away with the black album to come back half-assed is like, ah, oh, man, like you should have stayed in the game. You should have, it was premature. I kind of alluded to like kiss and they're like seven farewell tours. It's like, you gotta, you just stick with it and not make this big announcement because you kind of spoiled it for yourself. But I love Jay-Z. I've talked about it on here before. He's a business idol of mine. So I uh, appreciate everything he does, but this album, yeah, it didn't do it for me. Even after the revisit today, I thought I might have a different take on you know, being older and maybe like going back to something that kind of represents the time because 06 just is such as eons ago. So it's nice to check music back out like, oh, okay, maybe I like it now because it's, it kind of frames that year, but nope, it's, it's not, it doesn't do it for me, but it gave me an opportunity to see him live. So when I saw him, he was promoting, no, he wasn't promoting this. He was promoting American Gangster and he did a show at Madison Square Garden with uh, Mary J. Blige. It's one of the best rap shows I've seen, but um. Yeah, there's just not that many good songs on here that I can not feel the urge to skip. <laughs> so down to the artwork, you know, it's like, is that supposed to be like a Black album part two or something? It's red instead of black. I don't know. Everything about the album just seemed off center. And I think a big part of it might have been the fact that the, the album was recorded from 2004 to 2006. So it's kind of like, it seems like it may have been like leftover tracks as a way to get back into the game. I think you might be onto something there. So this is an album that, in the time I fell into the narrative of this is a kind of a missed album. So I didn't really listen to it much back then, which is funny because I bought the CD back then. Cause I remember it had, you guys remember a little something funky about the CD? No, I don't remember the copy. I had the jewel case was, I think it was red. Yep. Had a different colored jewel case, uh, which was kind of funky and different. You see that every now and then, but uh, yeah, I kind of fell into that and I think I bought it because it was like nine ninety nine. It was one of those like discounted CDs that you could get on sale and stuff like that. So I didn't listen to it much. But in preparation for this episode, I did listen to it, and I totally get why this was a miss album for him. Again, you got to factor that in for Jay Z. It's just coming off the Black album. The bar is so high. He's, there are no great songs on it, and his rhymes are probably okay, and his flows okay, but. Uh, the tracks are a little sleepy for me, and the beats are a little sleepy. There's nothing really memorable. Like, if you look at the albums leading up to this, Black Album and Life and Times and all that, uh, Hard Knock Life, like, there's standout, memorable tracks that, like, either they have a hook or they have lyrics that you're going to remember. This doesn't. Like, I don't know. I don't even... Like, the production sounds like it wasn't mixed or mastered. I don't know what happened with it. That's my... And that was my initial take today. So I think the, and it's hard for me to say this because I think if you look at other albums from Jay-Z or any other rap artists, you're going to have different collaborations and different produ producers. So production being off is bound to happen here and there just because you're getting different vibes from different producers, you know, from track to track. And sometimes it works, especially if the lyricist is to somebody like Jay or Nas or Eminem or Sometimes that's okay, but sometimes it's like, I would love to hear you on all Kanye beats. I would love to hear you on all Dre beats. Um, I do I do think one, uh, one song is a standout. I think Lost Ones is great. 
I think the piano is cool. It is sleepy-ish comparatively for the, to some of the other stuff that Jay's put out, but I think that one's really well done. And that's a Dre beat too. So yeah, I don't know. It it's good background. Like you you think Jay Z, you know, you're you know you're hyped up, whatever. This is like for me ba- background music, not to the extent of like was it four forty four, the newest one. Mm. But the other thing that was kind of interesting was I feel like he tried to add some like melody in his delivery and the key, the key of it was flat like you know when Eminem tries to add harmony and sing it's off key mm-hmm. yeah like like it's not sharp it's flat that's what the so parts on this album are like uh it doesn't sound good i don't know what you're going for it just does not sound good but yeah th- it, it's a miss and i probably won't revisit it mm. but it's not bad you know what i mean it's not a bad album but when you can put on either this or the black album like i'm not going to choose this yeah like brandon said uh from our interview last week like we can't say it sucks because obviously it doesn't suck it's jay-z right the guy's a mastermind so it doesn't suck in the grand scheme of things but for jay-z it's just not his best and you also have to remember this is 06 so nas dropped uh hip-hop is dead which is a phenomenal album and this came out and this was right after the whole uh king of new york best rapper alive feud mm-hmm. nas or jay-z and jay-z drops this and nas drops hip-hop is dead it's like oh man well Put side, put them side by side, and one's clearly a winner. You know, Nas is in his yeah. bag. Jay Z's kind of tagging along on Black Republican. That's a great song. It's probably one of the best songs on the album. But um, yeah, this it, one it like, is. I think it is. And like you said, this one doesn't even have a standalone track. I was like trying to write down one that I thought was decent, but I mean everything down to like the intro music for "Show Me What You Got" the single. It's just like it just rubs me the wrong way. I don't know why. It's like what what is this Aladdin sound? Like this doesn't work for this at all. <laughs> oh, that was the all I want to do is a zoom 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 and you boom boom right. It's that that yeah. that saxophone Teddy Riley back in the day. Oh, is that what it is? Rob, nice. what's it? Oh, Rex and Effects. That's the name of the the band, right? Yeah. I'm Quote me sure. on that. Probably. It'll be on the it'll be on the playlist. You guys haven't heard that? You'll you'll know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, I think I I don't know. Teddy was, Riley from I, Black Street. It was his first first band. I didn't know that that was the name of it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> Deep nerdery. So what about the fact that this was nominated for Grammy for Rap Album of the Year? Was the year in, bad? I can't even, I don't even know. In 2008. Or, yeah, in 2008. How? So like Came out in 06. A year and a half later. Weird. I don't know. Was it, what, did we cancel the Grammys in 07? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, let's give it to Jay. Yeah, Kanye's graduation got it. Thanks. So maybe it was yeah, 07. Makes- Wiki says 08, yeah, though. Yeah, it's, well, Graduation is a far better record. Um, so, yeah. good on Kanye. Right. for. I think that just showcases the fact that it's a boys club. I mean, he got nominated yeah. and the album sucks. Everyone can agree that this album just isn't in it's top not great. one. We don't, it's, it's Jay, as you said, it's Jay-Z. It, it doesn't suck. It's it doesn't just suck. It's not up to Jay-Z's yeah. standards. Yeah. yeah. All, but, all but positivity here at the Potty Sunday podcast. True. The three Ps. True. Well, especially for me being in New York, like fresh in New York City and seeing it plastered everywhere. I'm like, the amount of promotion that went into this album. Oh, that's that's because it's Jay and you're in New York. Yeah, well, exactly. He's got all the connections. So like this is 07 or sorry, 06 going to 07. So I just moved there and like radio still big. So Hot 97 is like the shit. And like this is when all the rappers drop by the radio station and like it's always say controversial stuff. It becomes headlines around the world. I don't know why the Hot 97 has some way of like triggering their guests or something because it always goes viral but um i remember hearing these interviews with jay-z and just, put some respect on my yeah. name put some respect on my name <laughs> but uh just shows you the times you know i always like to to remember like 06 to 07 that was like that paradigm shift when the iphone came out so everything pre-06 and after 07 is a different landscape so this was like right on the cusp and uh yeah i don't know maybe there was too much pressure for him to put out something amazing he just couldn't couldn't uh match the black album well, why did he even retire in the first yeah. place? Yeah, what was that yeah. About? Publicity. Like, oh, this is my last album. Like, no, it's not. And then you're, that's funny. He almost went, you know, the the personal album route with uh, naming it, you know, Sean Carter or whatever. You see, you see that every now and then. But he got nominated for um, "Show Me What You Got" too, best rap solo performance. Wow. So, yeah, it's uh, inside job for sure. Right. It's got to be. Yeah. So I think consensus is we all don't love this album. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think we're pretty aligned. It's it's okay. I was hoping to have a different take on it. Like, I didn't like it when I first heard it. I only listened to it one full time. I spun it one time. So I was like, ah, you know what? I didn't give it the time of day. This album probably rules. 
And, no, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> the, clo- the closing yeah, track no. is Beach Chair with Chris Martin, which is just not good. <laughs> yeah. Well, isn't there, I, I heard today there's a lyric about uh, Gwyneth being more popular than Chris Martin. Some some play That's on that. Funny. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so like I didn't understand, like I didn't know he even knew who he was. And then the last track, Martin's on it. So it's like, all right. So yeah, that that's our last uh, our last thoughts there on that Jay Z record. Um, okay, so last one, one that I think we're gonna have, we're gonna butt heads a little bit on. What Oof. is that one, Nate? I want you to I want you to tell us what is that one. It is edema. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I was hoping you'd say saliva. Actually, saliva. <laughs> we should bring the saliva thing back. Yeah. Um, nope, it's uh, <laughs> it's a fan favorite. Not quite a house band, but it should probably should be. It's Weezer, and the album is Pinkerton. The gloves are going to come off here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we did touch on this back on our uh, Bring Your Own Hot Take segment uh, back last summer. Um, uh, my hot take was Weezer has only put out one great album, and it's the Blue Album. And Nate vehemently disagreed with me and said that Pinkerton is, is also up there, and I, I don't think so. So, well, Nate, tell me why Pinkerton is a great Weezer album. Well, I like it a lot. So I have some history with this album. Uh, I was an early fan. So this album dropped in 1996, September of 1996. So obviously our formative years of music appreciation. My brother's a big Weezer fan. So I was able to check this kind of check this out kind of early. And I think I really like it because it's a complete departure from the Blue Album, which is obviously their best album. And, uh, you know, it's just a masterpiece. And this just goes in the complete opposite direction. And I really in a weird way admire that for some reason i don't really know why because if they had followed the blue album cadence it would have be it would have been you know like this ramones type thing where every album kind of follows in sequence but um yeah this one just throws everything out for a loop and i just like it it's a full-on rock and album it's like a garage rock album and uh all over the place there's a little weird things that you hear if you blast it or listen to it in headphones with a uh, matt sharp and it's just weird quirky like backing vocals weird weird stuff you know both lyrical and uh, music wise on this album it just seems like it's super funky uh, but i've always appreciated it and always liked it down to the artwork like i have a poster set by the same artist i think i have six posters of the same type of artwork it's not the weezer poster which i actually i do have that one too buried in the nature nerdery but that's nor here nor there but uh yeah i just i just really like it i dig it and uh i'll always stand by weezer pinkerton okay so i I understand where you're coming from. And I think as a Weezer fan, I'm in the minority. A lot of people who are fans of Weezer and have stuck with the band through all these years are fans of Pinkerton. I know we talked with Spose on episode 29. He will agree with you, Nate, because he's a big fan of Weezer and was a fan of Pinkerton. I, I think it's a hot mess. I think there are two top five Weezer songs on this record. El Scorcho and The Good Life are probably... Two and three, or three and four, on the the all time Weezer song playlist. But the rest of the album is an absolute mess, and I just think it's <sighs> they put the first album out, the Blue Album, which I absolutely love, the front to back, not a bad song. You take your car to work, I'll take my board, man. I'm I'm all in. I'm all in on the Blue Album. I I just this came out, and I don't I don't connect with it from the jump, other than those two stand you know standalone singles. That were obviously very good, but I think part of it is that Rivers was, you know, back and forth from Harvard trying to, you know, better himself through higher education, uh, and they're also trying to write an album, and there was just a lot of angst going on there, and they went from being a band that was, you know, hit it big and and all over the radio, all over MTV, with uh, the first album, to we're gonna produce this ourselves. They're too young, too early in their career to not have a little bit of guidance in the producing aspect, I think. Had they had a little bit of guidance, there's some stuff in there that might have made this better. But, hey, man, I, it did give us El Scorcho, and it did give us The Good Life, and those songs are unassailable as far as Weezer songs go. But overall, man, I, I just can't get behind it. Like, it just doesn't – it just feels like a hot mess. Tuan? Yeah, so this is very similar to um, Jay-Z – the Jay-Z album in terms of I fell into the narrative at the time that this was 
a not a good album because I think that's I mean that was in the moment that was like it was kind of this quirky weird follow up to this mass commercial success so I never really checked it out and I'm not like the biggest Weezer fan but I I do like um, Blue Green was Maladroit or Make Believe I don't know after that it kind of lost me because they they just put up put out too much so much music hard to keep up but anyway I checked this out today and um, while I can see why people didn't latch onto it. I think it's a great record. I think it's a great record. It has that kind of indie garage rock. Like here's my take. If this album came out first before the blue album, they would have been like the college radio darlings, like how modest mouse was before they blew up. Not, not like college jamming, but like college rock, like CMJ charting. They fit that perfect. But I think because this came out, after the commercial success it almost doesn't make sense again we always want to know like the how and the why i want to know why and how this all came about like like you said tone what like what they produced this themselves i didn't know that yeah. is that what you said yep. like they recorded it themselves if, if you look at the yeah. production yeah. credits it says weezer they're like 20 the they're label, like 20 like, years old or 21 years old like how is that okay <laughs> i don't know like the label gave them the keys to the porsche you know while they still have their learning permit it's 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 weird but I liked it. I really liked it. And and maybe I would feel more one way or the other. Like it would be, you know, maybe another year. It could be like a favorite album of mine or it could be just okay. But I, today listening to it, I was like, I like this. It's almost kind of got like, almost like that run for cover records kind of vibe. They're like kind of subdued album. You know, there's no real like standout singles per se. Oh, that's right. I disagree. Uh, the Good Life and El Scorcho are great. Those are those are radio hits too. The good life, especially, I think. In terms of like hooks yeah. and stuff, I don't know. It didn't like didn't really jump out in that sense. But in terms of like a full listen, I thought it was great. Today was your first full listen, right? Full listen. I mean, I've I've heard you know the the, the tracks on it, and I've skimmed it in the past. Like I skimmed it when we did that other episode of the Hot Takes. Is that what it was? Yep. The Hot Takes one. I skimmed it after that, but today I did two listens. One on the headphone and then one on the car in the morning. And it's a short listen. It was like 34 yeah, minutes. That long. Yeah. It's an album that the imagery of the album helps it. It makes you wonder, like, uh, honestly, I'm looking at the cover and I'm like, I want to go in the scene that's on the cover. Like, what the fuck's going on there? And why'd they pick that? You know? Yeah, that's a good point. It actually doesn't really match the album. It's almost like it doesn't make sense at all, but it is cool, really cool artwork. Yeah, the self producing thing is always strange. We know that doesn't work in a lot of ways for certain bands that we don't have to mention, but recorded in LA, New York City, and Boston. So clearly, when he's in Harvard, you know, that's probably where the Boston songs come into play. I think they were kind of waiting on, on Rivers because he's he was literally in college and kind of doing both. So maybe the label was like, shit, he's either going to break up the band or we're going to let them self produce because he's on his own island right now, apparently. Um, he was also struggling with uh, painkillers. I guess he had some surgery, so he might have been kind of out of his head, which kind of translates to the kind of music being all over the place. That's a great uh, comparison to one with uh, Modest Mouse because had this come out first, it really would be a college rock radio kind of underground scene hit. And uh, with him being at Harvard, he was probably fully immersed in the college scene, so that kind of that makes sense too. Other songs, though, t- uh, tone like key tracks. Uh, the closing track might be the the best closing track of any album that I can really think of. For them, on the fly. For them, what's that? Was it butterfly? Butterfly. Butterfly. One? Butterfly is basically a dashboard confessional song, right? Dude, you listen you to Only of... in Dreams. Holy shit, bro! Disagree. Yes, that's hard, what I mean. Hard, hard, hard. No, Only in Dreams is on the Blue Album. I hard disagree. Oh, true, true. Yeah, yeah. So butterfly is um basically just like a dashboard. It reminds me of a dashboard song, pre-dashboard, but uh, yeah. I think it's just, it was kind of a weird era for the band. And it was probably going to be, they're going to break up or we're going to let these guys going to do their own thing. But, you know, Matt left the band after. So obviously there was a lot of tension. Well, and they they essentially went on hiatus for a handful of years. Rivers finished school and then they came back and did the glossy green album, which was more in the vein of uh, the blue album. But I don't love the green album. I think there's good songs on it, but that's another situation for me. And like I said, last summer they have one great album it's the first one for me and it's since then i feel like i feel like they put pinkerton out and it kind of broke rivers for a little while and he was like all right well i'm gonna try to do what people think i should do 
and here's the glossy album and, and it's got hash pipe and it's got island in the sun and those are good songs but they're not as good as i think the first album has elements of both uh, pinkerton and the green album that meld together really well so you get that garagey i mean there's a song called in the garage <laughs> you get that garagey rock college radio type feel but it's got enough polish that you're like all right i'll come back to this um, these song structures are freaking great. There, there isn't a bad track on there. Whereas Pinkerton, they kind of let them do their own thing, and they, for me, they were led astray a little bit. They kind of went a little, went off into places that didn't, didn't really work. Uh, and then they came back and did the same thing on steroids as they did for Blue Album with the green one. And it's a little too glossy for me. It's a little too. I, I want that middle of the road Weezer that gives me a little elements of both because that's the best Weezer. And there's only one album that did that. And it was the first one. Yeah. You said something that, that, that kind of doubles down on like these records, are like out of sequence, like it's, the natural progression would have been Pinkerton. It's like the demo, almost like a demo, really. Like I, I could mm-hmm. see that. Then you get blue, they blow up, they get the taste of fame and then green album, which is, you know, that's the pop hits. Even they blow up even bigger and whatnot. But again, like, Pinkerton was the first album they put out with some fame, right? right? So there's always something there like, hey, maybe I want to retreat totally. back to my normal life type of thing. But I like it. I I enjoyed it. I would say, yeah, I'll probably revisit it. Probably revisit this one. And I don't know if you guys saw in like kind of doing some digging for this uh, record, but per their wiki, they have two new albums coming out this year. Yep. One like next. Okay, human. In a couple of days or something, right? Oh, yeah. It's like this Friday. Okay, human. And then there's like a hard rock. Van Weezer. Influence one. <laughs> Which Van is a great Weezer. name for a record. Great name. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll I'll check those out. Okay, human. Like, I don't know. I, maybe that. What's that? Indie rock? Uh, who knows? It's Weezer. Who knows? That's the thing. Like, they, they have been putting music out and it's been all over the map for a while now. And it, they, like you said, it's hard to keep up with. <laughs> yeah. I they, they did lose me. But it could be a volume thing. Like if they're putting records out every f- four years instead of every one or two, it looks like I might be more, or even two in the same year. Yeah, you made that point earlier. It's I think I kind of got lost too. I'm a big fan, but it's such a consistent flow of music, and a lot of it's, you know, not great, unfortunately. And I think they just set that bar so high with the Blue Album that like every hardcore Weezer fan has just been on this roller coaster ever since. Like, shit, like. <laughs> How do you top the blue album? You can't top the blue album. So no matter what, it's going to be like half good, half okay. Is Rivers okay? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> I mean, he's kind of a character of himself, right? Rivers Cuomo yeah. is like, he's got oh, those he's thick totally glasses. Yeah. So, I mean, that must be kind of weird in itself. But um, um, So are you saying, are, you, are we all in agreement that the blue album is their best album? Or is that just a Tony? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, that that, that that's a me thing. Uh, I'm on board with that, with probably Pinkerton yep. too, just okay. based on what I heard today. But I don't think Pinkerton's going to pass Blue. Okay, okay. It might get some additional legs, but I don't think it will pass Blue. Yeah. Because for me, Say It Ain't So, is it, it could be like a top. I've said this in the past, or maybe not in this podcast, but I think Say It Ain't So is a top 10 song all Great time. Song. It's that Great good. Great fucking song. Yep. It's that good. I, I, I begrudgingly like this more than I used to, but it still, still doesn't hit. For me. <laughs> well, it just, just doesn't hit for me. And I, and I'm not, I feel like I'm, a, I'm, I'm being, uh, you know, kind of dickish towards the band in this situation. Like I get some of the stuff you guys are saying where, yeah, there's a little bit of retreat cause you had this massive success and how do you follow that up? And the, the albums are maybe a little out of sequence. Maybe Pinkerton should have been their first record and then you get blue and then you get green and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now they're, like like Nate said, a caricature of themselves where they're just putting music out every six months and everybody's like, how is this happening? Like, where are you guys coming from? They're covering Africa by Toto. Like, they're just doing... Van yeah, they're, Weezer. Just, they're doing all kinds of crazy shit. But yeah, it's... For me, it was just... A, it didn't even have any kind of coherence. And uh, maybe maybe the garage stuff is not for me in, in that situation, I guess. But I do love Blue, and Blue is very garage rock album. So I don't know. It's funny because I agree with you, even though I disagree with you. I think you said that in, ep- in, a, in an episode prior, right? It's yeah. like, I agree with you, but I disagree. Like, I totally understand 
that it doesn't really flow together like an album should. It does seem like it's somewhat pieced together, but I still really like it. That's fair. Oddly enough. Oddly enough. I'm, I'm yeah. surprised I'm in the minority here. I thought I thought I wouldn't be. <laughs> I, actually, that like the fact that you just said that, it it's kind of weird to see how polarizing the yeah. takes are yeah. on this album yeah. across the board. Because I always thought... Again, it was almost like that New Found Glory thing where in the moment people shit on this album and then like years removed, it's like this weird cult classic. Yep. Well, and like I've said at the, to, to preface the whole thing, I think there's two top five Weezer songs on this record. Like they're just great, great Weezer songs. I just think the rest of it is not anything that I want to revisit per se. There's one song, I'll, and I'll pull it up. There's one song I was like, I'm going to skip this one. Um <laughs> That, those exist, though. Those are everywhere. Get You, number two. I was like, I'm gonna, this one doesn't yeah. do anything for me. I'm, I'm going to skip that one, number two. Yeah, that one goes right into it. But yeah, so you you think the back half of this album is gold for yeah. a little bit because those two songs are back-to-back, six yep, and seven. Those songs are great. Um, and I don't I don't hate, I think Across the Sea, I don't hate. And um, Butterfly is okay, but like they did a better version of that with Only in Dreams. Yeah. So I'm, I'm more, I mean... If I if I have a choice, okay, yeah, putting on only in dreams. Sorry, like not gonna listen to Butterfly if I can listen to only in dreams. Yeah. Also on the wiki, like River says that he was having some trouble kind of digesting the whole fame thing, which I can kind of see. Right, he's a, kind of a notorious shy guy, and we had Rob on here who said he had a not so great interview with him. Right, so he's kind of like an introvert. So I always yeah. find that strange to be in a rock band, be an introvert, but. I guess it works. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but they're yeah they're, they're, they do that, and I think there there was a whole like quote that was like, your life is thirty second conversations, and then back to your motel room, and you know you play a show, and then you're back in your motel room by yourself, and that's tough, especially back then when there's no other way to interact with people because the yeah there's no social media, there's no you know technology to the level that we have today, which would make being on the road a little easier, I would say, if we ever get back to that. Right. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm glad we saved that one for last. That was a was a good one because we all had differing opinions coming at it from three different ways. Nate loving it forever, me kind of not hating it, but being out on it for quite a while, and Tuan kind of getting into it today for the most part. I know. I was trying to go back to that hot take. Like you said, I think we're all in agreement that the Blue Album's the their best album. But I'm trying to like make sure. Did I say that Pinkerton was better? I don't think I did. No, I don't think you did either. I was gonna say I would. Well, I think you disagreed that they had. You thought Pinkerton yeah. was great. Oh, okay, okay. My my hot take was they've only put out one great album, and it's the Blue Album. I see. Okay, I I thought maybe and I stand I by I stand by my hot take that they've only put out one great album. It's the Blue Album. <laughs> <laughs> so here here's what we're Verified. gonna do. This year in 2021, we're gonna do the backpedal episode. So when Van Weezer comes out and you think it's great, you're gonna All back right, guys. <laughs> Van Weezer is the best album since the Blue Album. Okay, human. <laughs> well, I mean, that could happen. I'll probably spin that this weekend. Why the hell not? Yeah. <clears throat> cool. <laughs> no, that, that's a fun. That's a fun conversation. We'll do that again, right? That that was a good time. Yeah, no, it was great homework. Just kind of just like all day today, all three albums, just playing them, studying the shit out of them, like remembering all sorts of cool tidbits and literally the scenery of like this album in particular. I think I listened to this first on cassette. If I'm dating myself correctly, like. Either that or it was a disc man, but it was definitely something portable, not streaming. <laughs> this one never passed the, and I and I did this a lot, looking for bands, looking for for um, records I had either on CD or had digitally that I wanted to own on vinyl, and I had this one in my hands so Pinkerton so many times, I was like, there's just not enough here for me to buy this whole album. I just can't do it. I don't want to pay thirty eight dollars for this double album, so I didn't. You know, it was it was one of those that just never passed that test. You're right, because that test does exist. It's like, I mean, again, they're like, I'll be at the record store. I'll be, you know, on some vinyl distro site and there'll be a band I likes album that's on sale. But it's like the fringe album. Yep. It's like maybe the artwork's cool and maybe I kind of want it, but I'm never going to play it. Uh, and this records I don't play. I mean, I haven't left the shrink wrap. I just like looking at them. But. That's a great, uh, that could be a segment could in be. itself. Yep. The fringe vinyl owning uh, we segment. Have, we, Wait, so have we thought of a name no. for this? <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't have one. So when you guys are listening, this is now the end of the episode. 
hopefully you like the name that we came up with it for it. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be something catchy-ish, I'm sure. We could have it connected to beard- beardery and call it hoppy or floppy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, none of them really flop. We did call them flops, but they didn't really flop. Like, I think that Jay-Z album went number one uh, on the rap charts. And I think 20 yeah. overall. That New Found Glory album went eight compared to three and four for the ones before it. And then their their um the follow up after that was nine, eight or nine too. So right in the same vein. And then um Pinkerton did well commercially early, but then people didn't like it. So Yeah, it didn't go platinum until twenty which years is, later, which is crazy. Wow. The after the fact fans, right? The fans of Hurley going back <laughs> Hurley. and re- revisiting. Death the false metal. <laughs> That's another random Weezer album that came out a couple of years ago. Frank Maddox uh, did the cover art to uh, Hurley. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it would have been fun. He did make that joke that, yeah, man, I did make that. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> shit, sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Yep. But, yeah, good. that's a good spot to stop. We'll come back to that for sure. Hit us on the socials. Uh, slave podcast at gmail.com. Potty, at Potty of Slave on Twitter and Instagram. And we'll be back next week with more nerdery, I'm sure, right, boys? Yeah, we'll be we'll be back back at it, ready to, ready to rock and roll. And I don't know, could be an interview, could be a guest, could be original content. You'll just have to tune in and find out. Yeah, we'll just have to spin the wheel. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the wheel's back. <laughs> ah. Peace out. Cheers, everyone. I'm not going to steal a tone. Ah, peace, potheads. <laughs>